Oftentimes on this channel, we'll cover cops just failing to do their jobs, but in this case, the cops failed to do their jobs like 20 miles down the road, and that's a little frightening. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. On the evening of January 19th, 2008, Thomas James Booth III, or Tommy to those who knew him, was accompanied by eight friends to Bootlegger's Bar in Woodland, Pennsylvania. Tommy and his friends were residents of Wilmington, Delaware, which is a city that is about 16 miles southwest of Woodland, about 20 to 30 minutes on I-95. In Wilmington, Tommy worked as a master drywaller, which was a decently paying job that, according to his mother, Barbara McKay, and his stepfather, Ted Bush, Tommy absolutely loved and, in fact, excelled at. According to his parents, he was a respectful, kind young man, a little bit of a mama's boy, and, according to his mother, the glue that held their family together. And though Tommy came from a good, loving family, his life was not entirely without struggle, as he was a diagnosed epileptic and was prescribed Xanax as well as several other medications for his disorder, which also prevented him from driving. That epilepsy diagnosis is the reason that the night of January 19th, he was just a passenger in one of the three cars headed to Bootlegger's Bar. And since we've been spending so much time talking about bars and drinking and accidental alcohol-related drownings that probably weren't accidental or at least possibly weren't accidental, we thought that a perfect partner for this video would be Z-Biotics. If you've seen some of our cocktail streams, you know that we like to have a little fun here at the Lodge, but the next day is usually not quite so fun for us. That's why we're so glad that we found Z-Biotics, which is a probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is most responsible for rough mornings after drinking. The great thing about Z-Biotics is that it is an extremely simple to use system. Step one, make sure you're of legal drinking age. Step two, drink a bottle of Z-Biotics before your first alcoholic beverage. Step three is drink responsibly, pace yourself, and ensure that you get a good night's sleep. Then, enjoy your next day by feeling refreshed and making the most out of it. In case you're wondering how Z-Biotics works, it targets a toxic byproduct of alcohol that builds up in your body after drinking. But Z-Biotics produces an enzyme, like the one in your liver, that breaks down alcohol. That said, Z-Biotics will not break down alcohol more effectively, so you will not be less intoxicated by drinking it. And it also won't save you from poor sleep caused by alcohol. And when you get your Z-Biotics package, you're gonna notice a little proudly genetically engineered label on it. And in case that gives you some pause, if you're worried, Z-Biotics takes a naturally occurring probiotic that they modified just a little bit so that it breaks down that alcoholic byproduct. This is real science that works, it's not any sort of random plant extract, and it's not any sort of off-the-shelf ingredient. It's been rigorously tested and is FDA compliant. It includes only three ingredients, which are water, the probiotic, and some natural flavoring. It can be stored at room temperature. We also said make sure you're of legal age. This is only available in the United States, so that's the legal age of 21 for drinking, and this product comes in sizes of 3, 6, 12, 50, and 100. And you can save 15% when you subscribe with a 100% money-back guarantee if you are dissatisfied with the product. Bottom line, it acts like your liver, but it's in your gut where you need it most. If you'd like to try Zbiotics, you can go to zbiotics.com slash lorelodge or use promo code lorelodge to get 15% off your first order today. Unfortunately, nothing that Zbiotics brings to the table could protect Tommy from what was going to happen to him that night. The group that Tommy was with that night included six men and two women, all of them white, traveling in three cars. The first vehicle was driven by a 22-year-old male referred to in the reports as Driver 1.1, who was accompanied by a 24-year-old male listed as Passenger 1.2, another 24-year-old male listed as Passenger 1.3, and the latter's girlfriend, a 21-year-old female listed as Passenger 1.4. Car number two contained a 23-year-old male, driver 2.1, you can see how the pattern works here, a 21-year-old female who was passenger 2.2, and a 24-year-old male listed as passenger 2.3. The third and final car included driver 3.1 and Tommy Booth. Now, as far as who these people were, I believe I have identified up to four of them, but for legal reasons, I'm not going to give away names. The group arrived at Bootlegger's Bar just before 11 p.m. that evening, and all nine of them were captured entering the bar on a CCTV camera sitting above the door and to the right. 
Currently, we're standing outside of what used to be Bootlegger's Bar here in Woodland, Pennsylvania. And this is the establishment from which Tommy Booth went missing on January 19th, 2008. And while it's not publicly listed exactly where this bar was anymore, I'm pretty confident it's that door because you can see footage from the security cameras in the Smiley Face Killers episode that clearly shows somebody walking into a double door from a security camera pointed that way. So camera's right there, door's right there. I'm pretty confident this is the bar. It's now a GoPuff. And based on the sort of weird statements given by the guy who was supposed to drive Tommy home, if you look at this area, sometime around 125, according to this driver, Tommy's friends came outside because there was some sort of altercation. This may have been related to his friends getting kicked out of the bar because they were smoking weed, or it may have been related to something else. I honestly don't know. I'll, I'll go into more detail about this area when we're not standing in it. But they would have come out here. There was some sort of fight that happened around here. And 15 minutes later, Tommy's friend says he went inside. He looked around for Tommy, couldn't find him by 2 a.m., and then depending on which story you listen to, he either assumed Tommy had left with the rest of the group or he thought Tommy had met a girl and gone home with her. We'll get into more detail about why I think that's all a little odd, but we're not gonna do that right in front of it. Now, one thing that the group may or may not have been aware of is that Bootlegger's Bar was not exactly in the best location. This area, this neighborhood, Woodland, Pennsylvania, earns a D-plus rating from CrimeGrade.org. But oddly enough, that's actually one of the safer neighborhoods in the area. I'm not sure how relevant it is to anybody watching, but just to be clear about some of the terms we're going to use here, Woodland is a town, technically, but the way Pennsylvania works is a little weird. We have a layer of government called a township that sits between county and town. So... Our towns don't really have their own governmental structure, whereas the township will have a board. Townships can have multiple towns within them, and sometimes towns will actually cross township lines. For example, where I grew up, there's a little town called Wayne, and this town straddles Tredyffrin Township and Radnor Township. What that boils down to is that if you lived in a certain part of Wayne, you would pay taxes to Radnor Township, they would handle your trash, all of the things like that, whereas if you were over on the Tredyffrin side, Tredyffrin would handle all of your utilities and whatnot. I lived on the border of Tredyffrin, Easttown, and Radnor. There was a little nexus point. So there were people who lived up the street from me a quarter mile who went to a different high school. That's not to say that every single town in this state operates that way. For example, right now we live in Phoenixville, which is a borough which functions as its own little island. It's not part of a township. It's just in a county. So Bootleggers, which is now defunct, there's nothing there anymore, we checked, uh, that is in Woodland, Pennsylvania, that's the town, but it is within Ridley Township. So it was the Ridley Township police who were involved with this investigation. When it did exist, however, it sat in a shopping center at 1936 McDade Boulevard, and it backed up to Ridley Creek, a tidal creek that leads into the Delaware River. Bootleggers itself sat about a mile and a half upstream from where the creek empties into the river. Now, the group was there to celebrate the birthday of one of their friends. It was her 21st, but just two hours into being at the bar, two members of the group were kicked out for smoking marijuana. Those were Passenger 1.3, a 24-year-old male, and Passenger 2.2, a 21-year-old female. After this point, around 12.45 a.m., 1.3 called 1.1, who was his brother and the one who drove them there. He told him about being kicked out and asked if his brother could come out and if they could all just go home. So, according to the group, around 12.52 a.m., the passengers and drivers of vehicles 1 and 2 met outside in the parking lot. They say that they told driver 3.1 to make sure that he brought Tommy back to passenger 1.3's house at the end of the night, but after that group left and it was just driver 3.1 at Tommy at the bar, things got a little weird. The details get kind of hazy. Since only driver 3.1 was there with Tommy after that point, he is the only person who has any description of events after that part of the night. And that's important because, as far as anybody can tell, sometime between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., Tommy just vanished from bootleggers, and he wasn't captured walking out that front door on the CCTV camera. And if the stories told by Tommy's group of friends are to be believed, nobody even realized that he had vanished until around noon the next day. 
And even though it was Tommy's friends who first realized that none of them could actually account for his location, it wasn't them who reported him missing. That fell to his mother, Barbara McKay Bush, who learned from her other son that something was off when he called to ask if Tommy had come home the previous evening. His family waited to see if maybe he had stayed over at somebody's house and just hadn't made it home yet, but by the morning of Monday, they realized that Tommy was missing. Tommy hadn't come back with anybody. At that point, they filed a missing persons report and they themselves went up to bootleggers to look around and see if maybe he had passed out somewhere, if there was any sign of him, could they find wallet, keys, phones, something that would give an indication as to what had happened to their son. So on Tuesday, January 22nd, his parents walked up and down Ridley Creek, trying to find something, but failing. This led police to call in four teams of search dogs from search and rescue dogs of Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, just six days after Tommy's disappearance, the dogs were unable to come up with anything. As far as they could tell, there was no sign that Tommy had even been back there. As for why they were searching the creek specifically, that was not the only area. They were also checking up and down the nearby highways and streets, but it was assumed that if Tommy had gotten drunk and had had some sort of accident, the most likely place he might be was somewhere in the creek. So, the weekend of the 26th came and went without any updates to Tommy's case. Nobody really knew what had happened, all of his friends said that they had left the bar and they hadn't seen him, so there was really nothing to be done but keep looking and hoping something came up. So that's what Tommy's family friend, a man by the name of Bill, did. On February 2nd, he himself headed up to bootleggers, he walked up and down Ridley Creek all the way from the bridge that connects two bootleggers from the other side of the creek, down towards the end of Widener's Fields. Bootleggers sat just across the creek from the Widener University Sports Complex, so it was that, that was kind of the extent of where he checked. Now, an important detail here is that shortly after Tommy's disappearance, during that first week, a winter storm had blown in and frozen over certain sections of the creek. Because of this, it was thought possible that Tommy had fallen into the creek, but he had sank to the bottom and was trapped there by the ice coating the top. So when those search and rescue dogs first got out there to look, there was a layer of ice on top of the water. But on February 2nd, when Bill got out there, all of the ice had completely melted. There have been highs in the 40s as early as the 28th of January, and on February 1st, the high was in the 50s. So you were seeing that snow very rapidly melt. And because Bill had gone down after the ice had melted and had checked a long stretch of that creek, it was seeming more and more likely that Tommy had never ended up in there at all. Because if he had, somebody should have located his body by now. Because of that, everyone was pretty shocked when just the next day, Sunday, February 3rd, Search teams from Greater Philadelphia Rescue Service came across the deceased Tommy Booth sitting in Ridley Creek, just 100 to 200 yards from that back exit of Bootlegger's Bar. He was face down in the creek with his wallet, ID, and keys still in his pocket, but not his cell phone. Intriguingly, there was a set of boot prints, as well as what appeared to be a drag mark leading to Tommy's face, and both of them appeared to be very recent, as in, the boot print was clear enough to see the sole. After the discovery of Tommy's body, Delaware County Medical Examiner Dr. Fred Hellman performed an autopsy on the body. And this yielded some rather interesting results, considering that Tommy had been missing and presumed dead for two full weeks. That meant that it was even more shocking to everyone when Detective Scott Willoughby informed the Booth family that he did not believe foul play was an option, and that, per their investigation, it was most likely that Tommy simply accidentally drowned in Ridley Creek. And when I say the level of decomposition, the level is none. There was no skin slippage, no bloating, no discoloration. It appeared that Tommy had not been dead for all that long at all. The only place on his body that showed any signs of decomposition was his lower right abdominal quadrant, which is the first place that will start to discolor after death. Now, according to police, the reason he hadn't decomposed at all was because he had been underwater in a frozen creek for the full extent of the 14 days, which would have stalled the process. My immediate issue with that is the timeline and the weather history. I say that because on the night that Tommy went missing, the low was only 17 degrees, but it would only stay below freezing until the afternoon of the 22nd. After that, the average was about 32 degrees until the 28th, at which point averages climbed up to about 40 degrees, while the highs sat around 50. 
At those temperatures, the creek almost certainly cannot have remained frozen beyond February 1st. In fact, when we got down there on January 24th, 2024, it had been markedly colder the previous week. On average, it was 7.5 degrees colder, the highs were on average 9 degrees colder, and the lows on average 4.5 degrees colder. So the week before we got down there was considerably colder than the week before Tommy's discovery in 2008. Yet, when we were down by that creek, as you can see in this video, there was no ice. There was snow on the ground around us, but no ice at all. So, right now we're standing about 200 yards, 150 yards from that back door of Bootlegger's Bar. It's right this way if you want to show them. Obviously, everything looks a little bit different than it would have in 2008. This is a creek, the bed's gonna change the way that the everything looks precisely is going to change, but it's still going to follow the same general pattern. And there's been some construction over this way, clearly, that probably was not there in 2008 when Tommy went missing. In fact, exactly how much of the embankment that we're standing on was here is something I'm very unsure of. But what I can say is that if you look across the creek behind me, Tommy was found somewhere in this 40-yard stretch. And when he was found, he was face down in the dirt. There was a trail, it looked like, some sort of track mark, running a couple of yards, basically like this, that ended where his nose was. And on autopsy, they found dirt and other particles inside of his nose, suggesting that he'd been dragged. The other thing that I'll note is that these two sides of the creek are very different in terms of how steep the slope is. Over there, as you can see, it's pretty gradual, just kind of rolls down. There's a couple of steeper parts, but you never fall, or you almost would never fall directly into the creek if you went over that embankment. Whereas on this side of the creek, you, you pretty much would go right in. What that then suggests is that, yeah, if Tommy did go out the back of the bar and walk towards the creek, he could have pretty easily fallen in. And I'll show you if he did fall in further upstream, a spot that it could have happened. But if that night had someone kidnapped Tommy somehow, you know, slipped him with something in his drink or just in some other way led him from the bar, if you wanted to dispatch him elsewhere, and then place him into the creek, it's a lot easier to do it over on that side. And if you look at the crime scene photos, what you'll notice is that there are footprints in that mud. I believe on that day it was 42 degrees. So looking at the temperatures, the creek should have begun to thaw on the 27th, a full week before Tommy was found. Therefore, he should have been decomposing for at least seven days. And all of that is assuming that his body was actually frozen solid in the ice. If he had been underwater, he would have been in the warmer part of the creek, which meant that he would have been decomposing from the 19th. Of course, he would have been decomposing very slowly from the 19th to the 27th, but after that, he should have been decomposing at a much faster rate. Far too fast for him to be in this state when he was found. Considering the total lack of decomposition and how warm it was the week before he was found, it is extraordinarily unlikely that Tommy was in that creek for 14 days. Because he had been in the creek for 14 days, the location of Tommy's body actually also raised issues. If Tommy had gone into the creek by bootleggers and then somehow did not decompose for 14 days, then based on the depth and speed of the creek, his body should have ended up no more than 8 to 41 feet from where he went in. This means he would have had to have entered the creek basically in the exact location he went in, and having been down there, it's basically impossible to do that accidentally. As we've been out here, one of the things we wanted to do was figure out where he might have gone into the creek if he did actually accidentally drown. Now, first of all, I do want to point out how weird of a place this is to get to from where he would have been coming out the back. Uh, but it is a staircase. I'm not sure why he might have thought to go down the staircase if he did. If the creek was frozen over at the time, maybe he thought he could cross, but there's no reason that he would have crossed. Uh, Alternatively, if you look down this way, there's just absolutely no place that you don't have to climb up a couple feet of embankment before you go down what is obviously a pretty precarious slope. The other thing that I will say is, as Aiden and I approached this staircase right here, we both had the same question, which was, why? Why is this here? It's not really necessarily relevant to the case, I'm just curious why there would be a staircase here. Uh, it's also, this is wood down here. You probably can't see it, but that is, this whole thing is just a disaster waiting to happen for any drunk person coming out of a bar back here. But again, 
you you have to be looking for a way down into the creek to get here. You don't just kind of drunkenly stumble over here. There's concrete, there's sticks in the way, there's a log, even standing on a log. So... Yeah, I have no idea. One of the first things that does come to mind coming down here and thinking back to the Dakota James case and uh, the Little Cross Wisconsin cases is the fact that, you know, even though this is not the deepest of water, there are rocks, big, sharp rocks sticking up all over the place. And if somebody's body was in here for 14 days and was pushed down the creek by snowmelt, as the police suggested, I would be very surprised if they did not have a ton of, or at least noticeable abrasions, uh, which of course would probably be post-mortem abrasions, so they wouldn't be red. But again, just there's a lot about that that does not add up to me, especially given the state in which his body was found, but we'll get into that more later. One other thing that does stick out to me that I want to mention before we move on though is it's not just rocks. There's also a ton of debris in here and it is very visible. So somebody really would need to be under the water to be invisible here. You, you would very easily see them otherwise. Uh, also, again, I, I mean, there's, I can see rebar down there. Like, and it's maybe 12 inches from the surface when the creek is high. So I, I just would be very surprised if somebody could be pushed down this creek and not sustain a number of post-mortem injuries. But once again, you know, there's, there's the autopsy details to look at. We're filming this because on the one hand, I have made a significant error. This is not solid ground. The other thing is, we found a second spot that perhaps Tommy could have gone in where there's a little rivulet, but at the same time, if we look back that way, again, just no reason that he would have come this way, even if he left out the back of the bar, unless he was trying to get back to the parking lot. But if he was trying to get back to the parking lot, this is very obviously not a parking lot. It's over there. And that appears to be a kindergarten. Kind of creepy. It's actually super creepy, but moving on. This is by far the easiest spot we have found that you could fall in. And what we kind of did here was we walked towards the back door of the bar, then walked down to where he was found and kind of worked our way back up, as you can see, to figure out where the hell this guy went into the water. But the big problem is, while this is clearly the easiest place you could fall in, you know, it's just a simple slope down. It's very clearly sloping downwards and it's not really steep enough to fall down it without catching yourself on something. Um, it's not impossible, but we, we deal entirely in gray areas on this channel, so you know what, this is a gray area. But what's not a gray area is the fact that the parking lot is right there. Like, if he got this far, it's really hard to get to right here and go there instead of there if you're trying to get to the parking lot. So, I mean, looking at this, in my opinion, you'd have to be in a significantly messed up state of mind, like, to the point of trying to end your own life to accidentally fall into this creek. Not necessarily 100%, you could accidentally get in there, it would just be a weird series of coincidences. So those two details alone are enough to question the official narrative of this story, but as always, there is more to it. In this case, one of the things we're gonna talk about is the body's position and what was found directly adjacent to it. First of all, Tommy was face down, his head downstream of his feet, and at the opposite bank from bootleggers. And when he was found, of course, he was face down with his arms flexed inward like this. What you may notice about this is that this is not typically a position that drowning victims are found in. In addition to the strange positioning of Tommy's body, two sticks were protruding from the mud next to his right armpit and between his legs at the groin, and these appeared to be broken off branches that had been pushed into the mud. Basically, it did not seem like those sticks had gotten to that position naturally. And if Tommy had been floating downstream from bootleggers, it's really impossible for him to have landed in a way that the position of those sticks makes sense. The other problem is that there were two distinct sets of markings in the mud where Tommy was found. One appeared to be some sort of drag mark, while the other was a set of what were distinctly and obviously boot prints. Unfortunately, while they do appear in the recovery pictures, these boot prints were never analyzed or cataloged. They didn't even take pictures of them, let alone take plaster casts and try and identify what kind of shoe it was. 
So essentially what we're looking at here is boot prints leading up to Tommy's body that did not match any of the investigators or the people who found him. We also have a drag mark leading directly to his face and two sticks that appear to have been driven into the mud to pin him in place. The police found none of this suspicious, even though Tommy had mud on his head, his face, under his jaw, and on his torso, but really not on his legs. He also had mud in his nose, consistent with being dragged on his face after death. We can also look at the injuries he had when he was found, which include a number of minor bumps and bruises, but all of them were on the front side of his body. The only exception was an escar and contusion on the back of his right hand. Now, the injuries to his knees were red in contusions, while the abrasions to the face were not red. This suggests that the abrasions to the face occurred after death, while the contusions on his knees occurred while he was alive. He also had hemorrhaging in the neck strap muscle, where the clavicle meets the sternum, with more damage to the left side, consistent with being placed in a right arm headlock. And then that injury to his right hand was actually consistent with a cigarette burn, as it was a spot of sloughed off skin surrounded by a red contusion. And from what everybody told police, Tommy wasn't really the type to take a cigarette and put it out by burning himself to prove that he had a high pain tolerance or something like that. That just wasn't Tommy's style. So it seemed more likely that somebody had put a cigarette out on his hand. Some other things that stick out about this to me are that if Tommy had fallen down that embankment, he wouldn't just have injuries to his knees, and they wouldn't all be on the front of his body. He would also have injuries to his elbows, his arms, anything else that protrudes like a knee does, any hard surface that's going to knock around on things, and he would have injuries to his back as well. Internally, his tox screen showed a blood alcohol content of 0.22%, which would have been lower at the time of death because after you drown, your blood alcohol content will increase. He also had 0.01 micrograms of alprazolam, which is Xanax, per milliliter of blood. I won't go into details, but in my experience, drinking while on benzodiazepines does not make you go for a swim. It makes you stare at a wall at the den in State College until the bouncers kick you out. It's also odd that he was prescribed Xanax for epilepsy in the first place, because while Xanax can be used to stop a seizure in a hospital setting, it is absolutely not a preferred medication for an epileptic. This is because one of the symptoms of Xanax withdrawal is actually seizures, and that's in people who don't get seizures. If you are not a seizure-prone person and you stop Xanax cold turkey, then you can get seizures. And when you're an epilepsy patient, that risk is even higher, and those seizures can be fatal. And I'm not talking out my ass on this one. I actually asked my psychiatrist, I was like, hey, uh, is it weird for an epileptic to be prescribed Xanax? And he said, yeah, that is definitely not a preferred medication for, for epilepsy. He should have been on anticonvulsants, which he probably was, as we know he was on other medications, but the Xanax one is a really strange choice. That said, doctors are known to make mistakes and prescribe the wrong drug for a certain type of symptom or a certain disorder, so it could be that his doctor thought Xanax was a good idea for some reason, or thought that it was somehow worth the risk, but again, I don't know, and you are just gonna be shocked at how many times the cops dropped the ball here. Actually, to be honest, if you've been keeping up with our content, you, you probably won't be shocked at all, but it is more than usual. I should also go on to say that my personal experience with these substances is not going to be universal, and it is possible that different people have different reactions, but I'm just saying that in my personal experience, I had the opposite reaction to what allegedly happened to Tommy, and both of these are depressants. Also, as far as the, the cause of death being alcohol-related drowning, there is a blurred out section in the medical examiner's report in the episode of Smiley Face Killers The Hunt for Justice where they go over Tommy Booth's case. That's not the only thing I used to research this, but that, that is the only spot I could find any bit of the ME's report. Now, I don't know what that blurred out section is, I don't know if it's relevant, and I can't possibly tell you because the Ridley Township Police Department is pretending they didn't receive our right to know request. Usually, we can't go knock on the door of the cops when they are, uh, you know, giving us trouble. In this case, we can and will. I don't care if I have to hand you that form in person. I am getting this information from you. All of that said, the blurred out section could also be related to an allegation made by one of Tommy's relatives, which was that he was a frequent cocaine user. However, the talk screen recorded that there were no significant amounts of cocaine found in his system. In fact, in the book Case Studies in Drowning Forensics by Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, they say that there was no evidence that he had cocaine in his system at all. And if you guessed that the cops failed to ascertain what Tommy's prescribed dosage of Xanax was, then you would be correct. 
Without that, it's impossible, based on the micrograms per milliliter of blood, to tell when he had last taken his prescription. It's also impossible to tell how much he had taken. Another internal aspect we can look at is lividity, which is the way that bodily fluids pool in soft tissue after death. And this is, of course, affected by gravity. That's important because while Tommy was found face down, all of his lividity suggested that he had been on his back when he died. In fact, the presence of lividity on Tommy's back suggests that not only did he die on his back, but he also remained in that position for long enough for lividity to become fixed, which means he was on his back dead for between 6 and 12 hours. We can also look at the pale or blanched spots on the posterior side of Tommy's body. These were on the shoulder blades, buttocks, calves, heels, and the back of his head, meaning that he was also on a flat surface during the time that all of this was occurring. Now, obviously, being on a flat surface is absolutely inconsistent with accidental drowning. But amongst all of that, one thing stands out which really heavily indicates that Tommy was not in the water for 14 days, and that's that he was in full rigor mortis, which usually dissipates within 36 to 48 hours after death. Cold can delay it, but even then, unless the body is completely frozen solid, rigor mortis will still dissipate within 72 hours. For context, the time between the presumed death of Tommy Booth and the autopsy was 369 hours. Based on the temperatures that previous week and the medical examiner's findings, Tommy Booth cannot possibly have been dead more than 72 hours or since the morning of February 2nd. And the morning of February 2nd is several hours before Booth family friend Bill walked up and down that creek. That means that he almost certainly would have seen Tommy's body sitting in the water, but he didn't. It's also worth mentioning that Tommy's eyes were cloudy but not opaque, which again indicates he'd been dead for less than 24 hours when he was found. Putting all of that together, Tommy's situation at the time of recovery was as follows. Obviously, he was in full rigor mortis and was not yet coming out of it, indicating that he had died within the last 24 to 48 hours. Then we can tag on the cloudy but not opaque eyes, which bring it down to the previous 24 hours. Now, this is not necessarily an exact science. These are just indicators, but both of them are pointing to a very short period of time between Tommy's death and Tommy's recovery. He also had no significant amount of any drugs in his system, and his blood alcohol content was 0.22. Once again, if he had gone into the creek 14 days earlier, his blood alcohol content was likely slightly lower at the time of death. But we know, well, we think, based on the evidence, that he wasn't in the water for 14 days at all. But had he been, it probably would have been down closer to 0.18 to 0.2. For a guy who, according to statements by those who knew him, drank pretty heavily, this means he probably would not have been blackout drunk. We also know that he had superficial injuries, but only to the front of his body, and only the ones to his knees, his hand, and the upper part of his chest uh, appeared to have occurred while he was alive. The abrasions that were up here around his face, those were not reddened, which suggests that they were post-mortem. As for the injuries to this part of his chest, they were consistent with a right arm headlock. And on his right hand, there was that injury that was consistent with a cigarette burn. As for the location and search, he was too far downstream for his level of decomposition. A search just the day prior turned up no sign of him. Cadaver dogs capable of scenting a body in up to 12 feet of water, and keep in mind Ridley Creek was at its deepest during this period, 5 feet, were completely unable to scent him during this period. And this wasn't just one dog, this was two separate dog teams that searched that strip multiple times. There were boot prints next to his body and sticks holding it in place, suggesting that he was staged, and his friends told really sketchy stories about what happened that night. What all of that suggests to me, when you put it together, is that Tommy Booth absolutely unequivocally did not go into the creek on the night of January 19th, 2008. So, what did happen? Well, in my opinion, the Ridley Township police just simply failed the Booth family. Looking over Tommy's case, it is extremely difficult for me to understand how anybody could feasibly consider this to be an accidental drowning and not a homicide. In the medical report, Dr. Hellman even said that all of the circumstances here sur surrounding Tommy's death and his recovery were suspicious. And in March of 2009, he told the Smiley Face Killers team that he was 99% certain that this was a homicide, he just couldn't quite explain how it happened. That said, his report did say that it was most likely, or that it was probable, that his death was the result of an alcohol-related accidental drowning. 
Looking at the medical examiner's report, Dr. Hellman said that all of the circumstances regarding Tommy's case were suspicious. And he told the Smiley Face Killers team in 2009 that he was 99% sure that this was a homicide. However, the cause of death was listed as probable drowning as a result of alcohol intoxication. That said, he listed the manner of death, whether it was an accident or a homicide, as undetermined. Based on the medical examiner's other findings, Kevin Gannon suggested that this was probably a case of dry drowning, one of the few that actually occur. This is because there was blood-tinged fluid in Tommy's airway and a lack of water in his lungs. This could suggest that Tommy was being held underwater and trying not to inhale any of it, which would make sense if his killers were trying to make it seem as if he had drowned. This would also explain the lack of visible life-threatening injuries, as well as the absence of any significant amount of drugs in his system. However, I should also note that it's possible Tommy was being held and that he didn't have access to his anticonvulsants, he didn't have access to his Xanax, as a result had a seizure, a fatal one, and that's how he died, in their custody without them intending to kill him. All of that explains how Tommy might have died, but not necessarily who killed him. But I think it might be simple to answer that, if complex to prove it. I say that because a week before Tommy went missing, his mother heard him on the phone with somebody in the other room saying, no, I would never do that, man, and other things of that nature, as if he was being accused of something by a friend. He refused to tell his mother what that call had been about, but he had, on a couple of occasions, said something along the lines of, well, I won't be around much longer. Not in a suicidal context, but in a, I'm going to not be physically in this location context. Then, on the very night that Tommy went missing, he called his uncle, retired Colonel Bradley Booth, and told him that he was considering moving to Florida because his friends had been getting into some rather illicit stuff that he did not want to be involved with. This led his uncle to ask Tommy if it was something like robberies, but Tommy told him, no, it's much worse than that. To me, something worse than robberies suggests drug deals, trafficking, or murder. Obviously, there are other possibilities, and what people consider worse or not worse than robberies can vary from person to person. That's a little objective. Subjective. Not objective. It's a little subjective, obviously. I, why can't I talk today? Furthermore, the stories told by his friends about the events of that night just don't add up, so let's go over what they were. As I said before, this group included six men and two women, plus Tommy, in three cars. That first car, of course, was driver 1.1, who was a 22-year-old male, a 24-year-old male listed as passenger 1.2, another passenger who was a 24-year-old male listed as passenger 1.3, and 1.3's girlfriend, who is only named as 1.4. Passenger 1.4 is whose birthday they were celebrating that night. The second car contained 23-year-old driver 2.1, 21-year-old female passenger 2.2, and 24-year-old male passenger 2.3. Third car was, of course, 25-year-old driver 3.1 and 24-year-old Tommy. Once again, I believe I've identified four of these people. I am very curious why the police did not follow up with them. As I said before, the occasion was passenger 1.4's birthday, and as for why they would choose bootleggers, a bar in a shopping center in a bad neighborhood across state lines that they had to drive on the interstate to get to, they said that they had found it online and just wanted to check it out. However, when speaking with the Booth family's private investigator, driver 3.1 said that while outside between the hours of 1.25 and 1.40, he was speaking to people he knew, and those were people he knew from previous times he'd been at bootleggers. So, the story about them finding bootleggers online was clearly a lie. And this is an extremely important aspect of the story, because driver 3.1 absolutely could not keep his story straight, and he kept giving very precise times, which is indicative of somebody who either has great attention to detail, and that's something that typically you can establish a history for, or of somebody who is being dishonest. That doesn't mean that in every single case it's one of those two things, but typically somebody is only either precise because they have a good eye for detail, or because they're lying. So here's how those contradictions break down. 3.1 told police that he had last seen Tommy around 1 a.m., at which point Tommy was in the hip-hop section of the bar. But in a different interview, he told investigators that he believed Tommy had left with everybody else around 1 a.m. Obviously, those two things contradict. But he also told police in a third interview that he'd last seen Tommy at 1.30 and that Tommy was headed into the bathroom, which of course contradicts with the story he told the private investigator about being outside during the time he says he saw Tommy headed to the bathroom. 
Finally, he told investigators that at 2 a.m., as the bar was closing, he tried to find Tommy, but if he had thought Tommy left at 1 a.m., as he told investigators, there's no reason he should have been looking for the guy. And he had told others that he thought Tommy might have left with a girl, which would imply that he saw Tommy talking with or leaving with a girl, but nobody else did. And when I say nobody else, I don't mean his completely unhelpful friends, I mean people at the bar. Someone alleged that they had seen him talking to three Hispanic girls, but when they asked Hispanic girls about Tommy, they never were able to tell them anything concrete. It seemed they barely remembered interacting with the guys. It's also odd that if 3.1 was looking for Tommy at 2 a.m., as it was his responsibility to drive Tommy home, he would have called Tommy to try and figure out where he had gotten off to. However, there was never a phone call from 3.1 to Tommy. That makes it seem to me like either he wasn't actually looking, he wasn't trying very hard, or he knew Tommy wasn't there. And another thing is that while all of Tommy's friends, at least the ones that were interviewed, told investigators that they had left without him at 12.52 a.m., the bouncer contradicted that. As far as the story goes, 1.3 and 2.2, male and female, were kicked out at 12.45, at which point 1.3 called 1.1 to ask if they could leave. And then at 12.52 a.m., passenger 1.2 was seen leaving the bar to link up with her friends in the parking lot. Those friends claim that they reminded 3.1 to take Tommy back to 1.3's house when he left the bar, and that they left without 3.1 or Tommy. The rear exit bouncer, however, who did not have a CCTV camera pointing at his door, told police that around 12.50 a.m., note that this was a general approximation of time, not a specific one, at 12.50 a.m. or thereabouts, he witnessed a girl who resembled passenger 1.4 leaving the bar through the rear exit with a boy resembling Tommy Booth. That suggests that Tommy did, in fact, leave the bar with his friends, but that they brought him out the back entrance, possibly because they were aware that there was only a camera over the front one. Unfortunately, the police completely failed to interview either of the girls, who were 1.4 and 2.2, and they never followed up with passenger 1.3 or driver 3.1, which is just unbelievable to me. Whether or not they even interviewed the other four people is unclear. There's another thing we can look at, which is Tommy's cell phone records. Now, once again, the rest of them, their cell phone records were not subpoenaed. Nobody looked at their cell phone records at all. Just Tommy's is all we have. And because his phone was never located, we only have the records from the cell phone companies. We don't have all of the metadata that would have been included on his phone. What we know is that at 12.54 a.m., Tommy's phone called a 302 number, the area code for Delaware, and that that number was serviced by Singular Wireless, which is now part of AT&T. Simultaneously, his phone received a call from a different 302 number, which happened to be a landline, which was connected to driver 2.1's house. Then finally, at 12.59 a.m., Tommy's phone called a 777 number, and you may recognize 777 as not being a real area code. It's sometimes used as a nuisance number, and it is reserved as one of those easy-to-remember types of numbers, like 555, 911, 411, things like that. You know, 800, 877, 855. But if you call a 777 number from a mobile phone, you're probably just going to get dead air, even though your phone will actually send a signal to the tower. When Tommy's phone called that 777 number, it connected to one of three nearby AT&T towers, but there is a problem there. The three towers were not equidistant from Bootlegger's Bar, and the way that cell phones work is that they send the signal out in a bunch of different directions, and whichever tower picks up the signal first will perform the service, unless that tower is either obstructed or too busy. This was basically at 1 a.m., so it's unlikely that any of the towers were too busy to receive the call, and there were no obstructions between Bootlegger's Bar and any of the three towers. So under these circumstances, you would expect that the call would be picked up by the nearest tower, but it wasn't. At least, not if Tommy was at Bootlegger's. Rather than connecting to the nearest tower, which was to the northwest of the bar, the cell phone connected to a tower that was east of the bar. The only plausible reason that the phone would connect to the eastward tower is if Tommy's phone was closer to it. And what's closer to that tower? I-95, the route back from Bootleggers to Delaware. 
All of this paints a picture of a premeditated kidnapping with the intent to murder the victim and then stage it as an accidental drowning. In this scenario, they would have taken Tommy to bootleggers. They would have made sure that he was seen entering the bar on camera, but not seen exiting the bar on camera. From there, they abducted him, made a few cell phone calls to throw the police off the trail, took him somewhere, held him there, forced him to get drunk, then they drowned him, either in a bathtub, with a bucket, who knows, but they drowned him, they placed him on his back while he died, and all of these lividity spots uh, arose, his rigor mortis set in, all of that. They then drove him back to bootleggers and dumped him into Ridley Creek, placing those sticks to make sure he didn't float back into the river and out into the Delaware, so that the police would find his body and assume it was an accidental drowning. That only leaves one question, which is why, but I think that's pretty obvious. Either they were doing illegal stuff, he wanted out, and they killed him to keep him quiet, or they thought he had already snitched, were holding him to interrogate him and hope that he would, you know, come clean and tell them who else they needed to go after, and then he, you know, died in custody, or they decided they were tired of it and just decided to, you know, end his life. Obviously, these are pretty broad-stroke versions of events, and the details might differ, but in my opinion, this case is completely solvable. It may actually be one of the most solvable cases we have ever covered. At the same time, I don't think it has anything to do with the smiley faces. The biggest issue with this case is that the police in Ridley Township just failed every single step of the way. And when I mean every step, I mean every step, because they didn't interview half of his friends, they didn't search homes or cars, they didn't check traffic cameras, they didn't subpoena phone records, they didn't analyze or even catalog the footprints at recovery, they didn't check the fluids in his body for microorganisms, they didn't ascertain if those microorganisms matched the microorganisms in Ridley Creek, they didn't check his prescription, they didn't check what food he'd eaten against what food was in his stomach, they didn't ask why somebody had prescribed Xanax for an epileptic, and... They also just kind of didn't investigate at all, if you look at any, uh, the entire case. It appears they never even went to Delaware to interview these people. I think they ruled this as an accidental drowning for one of three reasons. They may have looked at this and said, we are a small township, we are a small police department, we know this was a homicide, but we simply do not have the resources, and the people who did it, or probably did it, are from Wilmington, Delaware. So this is not a local problem. This was a group of people from out of town who came in, committed a crime, and then went back to where they came from. It's not our problem. They also may have recognized it was homicide, but believed that they were not well-equipped enough, didn't have the resources, or just didn't have the, the manpower to go and solve it in a way that would get a conviction. So maybe they said, all right, well, if we call this a homicide, then we have to show people who did it, otherwise it goes on the books as an unsolved homicide. Whereas, if this is an accidental drowning, well, I mean, tragedies happen. And then there's the third possibility, which is that they really are just that dumb. No matter what the case, I, I, I am confident based on us being there, us looking at this creek, having grown up in this area, that this is not an accidental drowning. Tommy did not accidentally fall into that creek. He did not fail to decompose for 14 straight days. He did not enter rigor mortis just before they found him because he had been under the water that entire time. There's just no feasible way in my mind that Tommy Booth went into Ridley Creek on January 19th, 2008, or I guess January 20th, 2008. Given the circumstances, given all of the available information, the police absolutely had probable cause to bring these people in, to ask them questions, maybe even to search their homes and their vehicles. They chose to not do any of that. They chose that. All of that said, we do occasionally get things wrong. Maybe we missed something here. Unfortunately, the Ridley Township Police Department didn't want to provide comment, uh, decided that they didn't need to respond to right to know requests or emails or really anything, despite the fact that, you know, we're actually local and just across the county line. But we're pretty confident about our course of events here. We're pretty confident that this cannot have been an accidental drowning, which really only does leave the homicide angle. Maybe we don't have the right answer for how it happened or why it happened. But as we always say, if you have ideas, if you want to let us know what your thoughts are, anything we should take into consideration, because of course with this we are going to do a meta-analysis at the end, you know, 
we very much appreciate it. Feel free to leave those comments. We encourage you to do so. We encourage you to discuss amongst yourselves because the way that we find answers for these unsolved mysteries is by putting all of our brains together and using the collective power of this community to come up with the evidence needed to make a determination. If you want to support what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to our Patreon for just $1 a month. You can also become a member here on YouTube for $5 a month. If you want to get something more corporeal, you can get our coffee from Tableau Roasting Company. The link is in the description. You can also get our merch from our store, which as you can see is right below the video itself. You know, just in the little bar there, you can buy hoodies and whatnot. Uh, we have a Discord server where all of the notifications for this channel are published. That is bit.ly slash join the lodge. And if you want to catch more Lore Lodge kind of stuff, we have other channels. Those are the Weird Bible, which will have new content this February. We also have the History Hut, which we're working on finding some stuff for. We have the Lore Lounge, which is going to be kind of a chill, just vibey show once we have, you know, a lounge. And I stream three nights a week over on my personal channel, Aiden Mattis, at the Aiden Mattis. We do some gaming, we do some reaction stuff, we do a little bit of music. It's a fun time, come hang out. And if you want to catch discussions about these cases and other things, live conversations with guests, you can get all of that on our podcast, which is live Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, unless there is something that, you know, causes us to move it, in which case it's usually Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We'd also like to thank Zbiotics for being a partner on this video. If you want to check out their product, it is linked in the description. Once again, I am Aiden Mattis, and thank you for stopping by the Lore Lodge.